and recording has started and now I want to see the participants. We have no attendees. We have four panelists. Okay, well, we're recording, so let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to the League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County Candidate Forum for Washington State Legislative District 29, House position number two. I am Lydia Zapetta, the moderator, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County and our co-sponsors, I welcome everyone to this virtual forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization whose mission for the past 100 years has been to empower informed and active participation of citizens in government. Candidate forums are one of the many ways that we do this. Anyone who is 16 years or older can be a member of the League of Women Voters. For more information on membership, go to our website, www.tacomapiercelwv.org. That's www.tacomapiercelwv.org. Today's forum is for primary candidates for House Position 2 in Legislative District 29. The primary election is Tuesday, August 4th, after which the top two vote getters will move on to the ballot for the general election on November 3rd. That is why it's important to vote in primary elections because you, the voters, decide who those top two candidates will be. This forum is being uh, recorded and will be posted at the League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County website. Again, www.tacomapiercelwv.org, but this time slash 2020 elections. There are three candidates for this house seat. In ballot order, they are Terry Harder, Steve Kirby, and Charlotte Mena. Terry Harder indicated he could not be here with us tonight. Um, our timekeeper today is also our league president, uh, Cynthia Stewart from Tacoma Pierce County League of Women Voters. She will indicate when the speaker um, has one minute remaining, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and it is time to stop. When you see the stop sign, you may finish a short sentence. Please stay on gallery view so that you can see everyone. Um, please do not talk unless it's your turn. Please mute yourself when it's not your turn to speak. The audience is on mute and cannot use the chat function. Many of our questions were sent in advance um, to anyone watching the questions. Um, and if they have a question, they can text questions to a phone number. It's 206-402-2262. That's 206-402-2262. Any additional questions will be consolidated and may be reworded to avoid duplication. So to start with, each candidate has up to two minutes for an opening statement. These will be given in ballot order. After um, answering the questions, uh, the, the order of answering questions will rotate. All candidates will be asked all the same questions. At the end, each candidate can take up to one minute to make a closing statement. So let's begin with our two minute opening statement. We'll start with Steve Kirby and then Charlotte Mena. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm gonna have my own timer going here just to help me keep on track. So, um, for anybody who is watching, if you live in the 29th district, I've been your state representative for uh, 20 years. And before that, I served 15 years on the Tacoma City Council. Uh, I ran for office the first time and, and got elected uh, in 1977 when I was 25 years old. And I've been representing the people of my community in some capacity ever since. I was born and raised in my district. I raised my family here. I know my district. I know how they vote and I know what they want me to do because I'm from here. When I'm in Olympia, I spend a good most of my time uh, fighting for things, just the, the usual Democratic Party values, good schools, affordable housing, and a strong economy. But I'm best known for uh, my work passing uh, consumer protection legislation. Um, so after serving on 12 different legislative committees over the last 20 years, I really do have a broad range of experience that, you know, working on lots of different uh, issues and 
along the way, I've, I've earned the support of a lot of different stakeholder groups, many of whom um, don't really trust each other, but they trust me. And <clears throat> my position is that that's what it's going to take to get us through what may be the worst um, budget crisis in state history. Um, my position is that this is not a good place, a good time to replace me with a new person. Seniority matters in the House of Representatives, and there are only four people out of uh, 98 House members who've been there longer than me. So when I walk into the Speaker's office, she doesn't like to tell me no, and that's important because it helps put me in a position to fight off legislation that harms my constituents, and I'm out of time. So just want to tell you there's never any shortage of that. Thank you. Charlotte Mena. Thank you. I just want to start by saying that I'm really humbled to be here today. Um, growing up, I didn't see a lot of women or people like me running for office. And as I've gotten older, I realize it's because there's a lot of barriers to women and people in the immigrant community um, getting elected. And I want to help change that. I also want to help and work for the people of the 29th to remove barriers for the district. So I'm Charlotte Mena. I'm the proud daughter of immigrant farm workers. And I'm running because I believe that I'm best equipped to lead our district into the future um, for next generations. Our district is changing. It's only getting younger and increasingly diverse, and we are facing many long-standing issues which have only been exacerbated by COVID. Right now, we're in the middle of a quadruple crisis, a health pandemic, economic devastation, police violence, and an administration that continues to roll back protections for women, immigrants, and for the environment. Our district is also one of the most underserved and is taking the brunt end of all these crises. For example, in the 29th, we have some of the worst air pollution of anywhere in the state, which disproportionately affects people of color, um, which is exacerbating racial and health disparities. I have experiences that are desperately missing in the legislature. For one, my lived experience is the Latinx woman um, from an immigrant family who has relied on these services, and we are heading headfirst into a recession. I think we need a champion who is going to be willing to fight to protect programs that help women, children, and families. You know, the second is my experience working in the U.S. Congress um, and understanding how these governments work together for economic recovery and how are we prepared to receive those funds and implement them. And the last is my experience working on climate and environmental policy, uh, which is very, very critical and important at this time. I guess I'll end by saying, you know, it's been said that um, junior members don't really have a lot of sway in Olympia. But I would implore you to look at any major piece of progressive legislation that has come through the legislature in the past couple of years and you'll see a junior member's name on it. Oftentimes we're not fighting about whether we agree on something or not. We're fighting for floor time when 3000 bills get introduced and we have time to pass 200. Who is there matters. Thank you. Now we come to the questions. The first candidate to answer each question will have two minutes to answer it or up to two minutes to answer it. The other candidate has one minute to add information or comment on what has been said. It's fair to say that I agree with the other person. Um, we, have about, we have up to an hour and a half, um, including opening and closing. So in the interest of answering as many questions as possible, brevity is always appreciated. The order of questioning will rotate with each question so that for question one, we will start with Charlotte Mena and then Steve Kirby, then Steve Kirby and Charlotte Mena, et cetera. Okay? So the first question is, as a state legislator, what legislation do you think is a priority to address the, on the ongoing public health crisis due to COVID-19? And this question is about public health. The next question will actually be on economic issues. So again, as a state legislator, what legislation do you think is a priority to address the ongoing public health crisis due to COVID-19? Charlotte Minna? Thank you. Yeah, I think there are several. So um, I'll say first and foremost is ensuring that we have health care for all. I support a single payer system. I want everyone to have comprehensive, affordable health care that is inclusive of vision, dental, um, is inclusive of sexual and reproductive health, um, gender affirming services, and is available to every single Washingtonian, regardless of immigration status. I want immunizations to be free as soon as they're available, and I wanna make sure that we're distributing them in an equitable manner, meaning that folks that are working on the front lines in our grocery stores and in the fields should have access to this as soon as possible, regardless of income. And unfortunately, that's just not how we see things play out traditionally. So that's something that I'll be focused on in terms of public health. Thank you. Steve Kirby? 
Yeah, this <clears throat> this this could be sort of an ongoing uh, problem uh, uh, here in that you have two Democrats um, um, in front of you, and so uh, frankly, there's not. I doubt there'll be a whole lot of difference between um, what the two candidates uh, would like to do. Um, so yeah, so I agree. Um, you know, I'm, I guess I'll take this opportunity like everybody else. I am for some form of universal health care. Uh, I would love to have single payer. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that that's something that's going to be a little bit more difficult to just start doing. But um, ultimately, you know, we're the only country, really uh, civilized country in the whole world that doesn't already have something like that. So we need to, you know, we need to get a get a handle on it. I think that I think there's a reason that uh, uh, other countries are doing better than we are. Thank you. The next question we'll start with Steve Kirby and then uh, Charlotte Mena. Again, two minutes the first uh, respondent and one minute the second. Um, what legislation would you propose or support to address the ongoing economic crisis, particularly unemployment? <laughs> Due to COVID-19, and how do you balance public health and economic needs? Again, what legislation do you propose or support to address the ongoing economic crisis, particularly unemployment due to COVID-19, and how do you balance public health and economic needs? Well, first of all, um, the governor is right to make sure that uh, uh, the the health and safety of our state residents is the number one priority. Um, what is on the table, you know, there, are, there are committees uh, meeting about this behind the scenes um, right now. And I am on the uh, economic recovery team in the, in, with the House Democrats. So uh, we, we meet regularly and we do um, um, talk about, you know, just generally what it is, you know, we would, we would like to do. Now, really, what is most needed is for us to insert ourselves into the process. Right now, um, you know, it's really hard to get through the fortress that um, is set up. Uh, even legislators, even our leadership has a hard time um, having input into what's going on right now. So probably one of the first things we'll do is to um, put some sideboards on the governor's uh, emergency powers so that we can have a, a little bit broader look at how things are, are done. We'd like to be able to more, maybe more surgically um, open up uh, certain businesses and put people back to work, but we need to do it safely. The governor is not wrong. Charlotte Mena. Please unmute. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think in light of all, uh, you know, how many people have lost their jobs, I want to go back and just reiterate universal health care, which will help us save costs down the line and uncompensated care and will make sure that folks are covered even as they've lost their jobs. Um, at the same time, we need to continue to provide that relief for people that are unable to work right now. Um, and we also need to expand that pot of money for undocumented workers who are risking their lives many times working to pick our food. Um, going forward, I think it is absolutely imperative that we consider progressive tax reform that relieves the burden on working families and that we're rebuilding our economy and getting Washingtonians back to work on green infrastructure projects that are going to help us build a more sustainable future. Um, finally, just quickly, I want to say that we should not have workers out there working without the proper protective equipment. And I think the state needs to lead on cracking down on companies that are asking or forcing their employees to work without that equipment. Thank you. Okay, the next question, we'll start with Charlotte and then go to Steve. Um, again, two minutes for the first person and one for the second. Um, what, if any, legislation would you propose or support to address racial injustice in Washington state? What, if any legislation, would you propose or support to address racial injustice in Washington state? Charlotte Mena. Thank you for that question. You know, I think it's hard just to name one piece of it. That's permeates every single institution in our government and otherwise. I mean, race affects our outcomes in terms of how much we make, um, what our education level is gonna be, whether we have the ability to purchase a home. 
Um, so right now, a couple of things that I would put my support behind are funding the Office of Equity, which was defunded. Um, that office was allocated $1.2 million. Maybe we don't have that right now, but we certainly have some money to at least get someone in the office so that we can systematically look at how to improve our processes across the board. Um, the second thing is I would continue to support environmental justice legislation. Working at the Department of Ecology, I was part of a team that worked on the HEAL Act, which forces agencies to take health disparities into account in decision making. That's what we need to be doing, and we need to make sure that those efforts are funded, especially now. Thank you. Steve Kirby. Please unmute yourself, please. There you go. Oh, you're still muted. You're still muted. Could you unmute yourself? I found it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if you stay off, if you don't mute at all, that would be great. Yeah, we're yeah, I'll, yeah. We we can probably behave. We're we, we'll we'll do that. So you know, it, it there isn't um, any one thing. Truly, what we've been trying to do, especially um, you know this last uh, cycle, and and it's just become even more and more important over time. We need to apply an equity lens to really every single thing we do. Um, we we just have to we have to recognize and acknowledge uh, the notion of inequitable systems, institutional racism, discriminatory practices, implicit bias. We you know these things actually exist and they are embedded in a system that limits access to opportunity. And the remedy is for us to consciously and to sincerely embrace diversity and equity and inclusiveness and basically just ensure that everybody has a seat at the table um you know in terms of everything that we do thank you um the next question we'll start with steve kirby again two minutes and then charlotte mena one minute what should be the role of the state in governing the activities of local police forces what if any legislation <coughs> would you propose or support okay yeah uh, Two minutes. This will be tricky in two minutes. Um, uh, we are there is a there is a an ongoing group. Um, remember uh, Initiative 940. There was a bill that we did pass. We had stakeholders from all over the state together. Um, we we did uh, get agreement, uh, um, and um, you know we we thought we did a, we thought we did a, we were real proud of ourselves <laughs> and. As it turns out, it wasn't enough. So that same group of stakeholders, and it's a big group. I've been on Zoom meetings with them, um, and you know we are we are trying to hammer out some improvements just to kind of um, uh, help to um, do a better job of doing police reform. We just need to, you know, I'm I've watched people. I've watched, you know, I, a day doesn't go by that. I don't worry about my two African-American grandsons who live in Seattle. I worry about them every single day. So, um, you know, I, we need to get on this. Uh, I'm, uh, this is, you, you, there's, there can't be a law against walking while black. There can't be a law against driving while black. We have to ensure, you know, we need to, I think we need to demilitarize the police. Back when I was young, uh, when I was a young councilman, the people on the police force were people I went to school with. Now we do most of our recruiting out of the military. Um, you know, and I just, I, being a soldier is a different job than being a cop. So those are the kinds of things that we're having discussions about, but there is an ongoing group that has, will have a bill ready when we walk in there in January. Thank you. Charlotte Mena. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I want to start with just saying, you know, Manuel Ellis was killed in the heart of our district. And, you know, that's not certainly the first time that this community has experienced police violence. Um, according to the National Academy of Sciences, one in every 1,000 black men can be expected to be killed by the police. And that's just way too much. I mean, we've had these discussions before. We've worked on I-940. We've done crisis intervention training. We've done de-escalation training we failed to institute community oversight in this process. There was a complete and utter failure to implement these trainings in the city of Seattle. So, um, you know, I think it's 
I think it's a good thing that we're talking about it, but I think our communities are tired of talk and they want some more action. So yes, they should not be allowed to purchase excess military equipment. They shouldn't be allowed to cover their batch numbers. But I think we should seriously think about what we're investing in as we're heading into recession and how much money we need to uh, put into training programs that are potentially not working. Thank you. The next question, uh, we'll start with Charlotte and then move to Steve. Given the reduced revenue and increased expenses due to COVID-19, how will you ensure adequate funding for critical state programs? What do you see as the budget priorities of Washington State? And what budget cuts, if any, do you propose? Charlotte. Thank you. So I think our most important priorities are those human services and those things that make the difference from someone barely hanging on by a thread to losing the roof over their head. So absolutely, the things that I want to help protect are those services like TANF, uh, affordable housing, you know, all the things that are protecting children and families um, and are helping them get by. I think going forward, we're absolutely going to have to think about how to raise new revenue. Um, I support a progressive, uh, you know, a progressive tax structure that relieves the burden on working families. I think we need a capital gains tax. I think we need a payroll tax. I think we should consider an excise tax for stocks and bonds. I think that we need folks that are earning the most to pay their fair share to ensure that there's equity for all. Thank you. Steve Kirby. Yeah, so <laughs> this is the difference between um, an incumbent who um, has to govern um, and you know someone who's looking forward to governing uh, someday. Um, there is, our, our budget people are meeting probably right now really um this is not this is it's going to be um probably the the biggest budget crisis that we've maybe in state history i've been there 20 years i've been through the great recession and there was another recession before that um we are charlotte is right those are the kinds of things that we need to do but unfortunately the progressive um measures that are on the table don't bring in money until sometime later on so um, we are we are going to have to take some really tough votes because we will have to do some kind of revenue. Um, we just uh, it, nobody there's no agreement on it right now. That's why there was no um, uh, special session uh, scheduled for August. Thank you. Following up on this, um, according to the Washington State Budget and Policy Center. Washington households with low or middle incomes pay six times more in state and local taxes as a share of their income than the wealthiest 1% of households, making our tax system in Washington state the most regressive in the nation. What legislation would you propose or support to our tax system to make it more equitable? We'll start with Steve Kirby, two minutes, and then Charlotte Mena, one minute. Thank you, yeah, that was a really good the last question was a good lead into this question. So some of the richest people in the world live in the state of Washington. And, you know, frankly, if rich people paid their fair share of taxes, uh, it's, you know, it certainly wouldn't, uh, you know, close our budget hole, but it would go a long ways. And, and right now, and fairness is, is what really is what we're, we're giving up. So, you know, I would, if, if it were in a perfect world, I would, you know, um, you know support, um, you know, a, an income tax, um, a, uh, a, a capital gains tax is on the table. Um, we have a, we have a proposal that's probably, I think it's fair to say it's even ready to go. But again, you know, that, that's maybe a, you know, all of our progressive tax measures that are on the table are like $300 million. So, you know, we're really going to, have, you know, we, it's going to take some federal help to get us through this. But um, the way the legislature works, the budget people are, you know, doing, they're actually negotiating with uh, um, their counterparts in the Senate right now. Uh, we get uh, weekly briefings. And so um, those are caucus briefings. And so I'm not at liberty to you know, get into a lot of them in terms of the, the actual discussions. But um, so to answer your question, I will not be introducing any of those. Those will be done by the appropriations chair in the House or the Ways and Means chair in the Senate. But, uh, you know, I will, as a senior member, I'll be a big part of those discussions. 
Thank you. Charlotte Mena? Thank you. So I think in my previous response, I outlined a couple of reforms that I'd really like to see. So I'll just um, take this opportunity to say that, you know, I'm not going to be a passive supporter of whatever the caucus or the negotiators decide. I'm going to be an active, proactive champion for the people of the 29th. I think we all understand um, that cuts will need to happen. It's what cuts we're going to allow to happen and who gets compromised in those processes. So absolutely, you know, we've already been making cuts across government, whether it's a hiring freeze or freezing out of state travel. I think my point is that we want to protect the programs that are the most needed. Um, and I think that is absolutely doable. Um, and, you know, as we do that, then we can look forward to how we bring in new revenue to make sure that those programs not only survive, but thrive. Thank you. Okay, the next question, we'll start with Charlotte Mena and then Steve Kirby, um, two minutes and one minute. Um, according to the state constitution, education is the paramount duty of the state, of the state government. What legislation is your priority for the education system in Washington? particularly given the lost learning effects of education due to COVID-19. Yeah, thank you. Um, there, are, there are several. I mean, the Supreme Court has said that the state has met its obligation under the McClear decision, but that's just not the case. We, we do not have equitable education for students in every single district in Washington state, um, and we're far from that. We still have our graduation rates trailing behind the national average for black students, Native American students, Latino students, as well as low income students, which disproportionately affects districts like the 29th. Um, I think digital equity is what we should be focusing on right now. There's not equitable access to broadband or internet in every part of the state, especially on tribal reservations or in every household even. So I think that should be first and foremost. But as we move forward, we need to think about who we're hiring, uh, what or sort of opportunities we're giving to uh, teachers from diverse backgrounds, and what sort of training we're giving, not just to educators, but everybody who works in a school, as well as fully funding uh, mental and behavioral health counselors who can really help our students, because we're seeing a lot of awful things happen, and you know, suicide rates increasing even as young as elementary school. Um, so my focus is how do we fill, um, you know, close that wage gap, and I think that starts in this moment with digital equity. Thank you. Steve Kirby. Um, <clears throat> agreed. Um, one of the biggest problems with, uh, you know, we, we can't fit all of our students in our school buildings and still um, uh, have adequate social distancing. So there will have to be some way for um, learning at home. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, and especially in our district, not everybody has access. And it's, it's, in, in rural areas, broadband access in rural areas is a big deal. We, you know, we have the, what we, yeah, we do have the, uh, the, we have access in people's homes, but not everybody has a computer. Not everybody can afford to, um, to go to school. And so we're going to have to provide that kind of access to people through actual, I think, handing out hardware to people. So yeah, just, just to add on, but I yeah agree with what uh, Charlotte says generally. Thank you. Um, the next question also has to do with education, and this question is a bit more specific. Um, and we'll start with Steve and then go to Charlotte. Um, do you support going to year-round or balanced year calendar schools? Why or why not? And we'll start with Steve. Sure. Yeah, that's. There's a bill every year to do that. Um, and uh, I'm not on the education committee, so I'm not really sure exactly, you know, what discussion takes place um, um, when those things come up for discussion. Um, I, I would actually support it personally, but you know, there, there are, you're kind of turning the whole system on its ear when you do something like that. And so it's, it's important to get buy-in from uh, all of the stakeholders, um, you know, from the school administrators to the, uh, the directors and, uh, and, and of course the, the teachers. So, you know, and don't, don't forget about the parents and the students. So, um, I just don't know that there's been adequate discussion for us to, you know, actually pass a bill. 
Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to having that discussion. And um, I, you know, I could, if, if it's, if it's, uh, I don't know, if it's agreeable to enough of the people that we need to have on board, I would be, in, I would be in favor of it. But again, I, I'm, I don't want to just do change for the sake of change. There has to be some benefit to the, to, to our kids. Thank you, Charlotte Mena. Yeah, so um, this is not an issue that I've been very familiar with or understand the nuance of, but there are a couple things that come to mind when I think of it. And, you know, one is at the heart of this issue, right, childcare. Um, where are kids going in the summer when their parents are working if, you know, if they can't afford childcare? And, you know, in this crisis, we've lost 80,000 spots around the state um, in childcare. So that's an interesting opportunity to think about how our kids are taken care of in the summer um, and in an environment where they can continue to learn and their parents can thrive at work. The other thing it makes me think about is food security or rather food insecurity. Um, and you know, a lot of our students in all four school districts, but especially in Franklin Pierce where 76% of our students are on free and reduced lunch, that's something I think about a lot um, and, and where they're going, how they're getting fed. Um, so it's certainly an idea that bears thinking about and um, Certainly, if it's not year-round school, then it's filling the gaps on all those issues in another way. Thank you. Okay, the next question um, also has to do with education in schools. Um, do you support mandatory opening of schools this fall? And we'll start with Charlotte again, two minutes, and then Steve Kirby, one minute. Um, it's a really hard question. I would say I do not. Um, I want to say that, you know, first and foremost, it's important that everyone is healthy. Um, the only thing that, you know, I want to think twice about when I say something like that is how are we making up that gap and ensure that our students are still learning. So I, I don't believe that we have enough space. I don't believe that we need to expose our kids to a global health pandemic by forcing them to go back to school as well as our teachers. We don't know if there are folks in their families that are you know, immunocompromised or high risk. Um, so I support, you know, doing what is safe, following the science, um, but also making sure that our kids have the resources at home to continue learning. Thank you. Steve Kirby. Yeah. Um, you know, the way things have been going, uh, actually our state, uh, you know, I'm um, kudos to the governor um, because I think our state is um, as, as safe a state as there is, you know, really in, in terms of, um, you know, where we are in the scheme of things. But um, it, if the question is mandatory, like sending all the kids back to school, well, you know, I just don't think that's in the cards, no matter what. It's just not going to happen because it's, it just won't be safe. Those kids, we can't have our kids infecting each other and going home and infecting their parents and their grandparents. And, you know, that just, that can't be. So we're going to have to um, try to work with the uh, with the OSPI um, and try to figure out if there's a way um, that we can educate our kids in a way that you could do in a classroom. But that's it's going to be challenging. This is not going to be normal times. Thank you. I just want to take a, a second here to say that it, there are people who are watching um, who want to call in with questions. Then they should call in at. Um, I can't see it when I'm looking at 206-402-2262. So let me, uh, oh, uh, yeah, there, there you we are. go. There you are. <laughs> okay. So if anybody has a question, please send, please text it to that number and you can have it answered. Okay. That was my PSA. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So the next question, we will start with Steve Kirby and then Charlotte Mena. Um, what state legislation would you support to address affordable housing? Steve. So, okay, a couple things. Uh, first of all, I think that we need to sort of tighten up what our, man, what our uh, definition is of affordable housing. What's been happening all around the state is we have, you know, programs in place to um, uh, encourage affordable housing but they're really not building affordable housing. They're doing a couple of, uh, uh, you know, you do a couple of affordable units in a, in a market rate building and call it affordable housing. We have to tighten that up. That's just wrong. Um, and then beyond that, the, um, the other thing about affordable housing, um, 
has to do with uh, some of the uh, changes to the Landlord Tenant Act. We left some things undone and we need to do those things, not the least of which will be to um, try to ensure that uh, we can prevent people from being evicted without just cause. And, you know, I just had a conversation uh, this morning with, uh, with an organization that, uh, that works on those issues. And um, we're, we have a plan in place to finish up what we did not get done. There's stakeholder work being done um, right now. Uh, it's something that we should be able to um, address early in the process. It's going to be a heavy lift. Nobody's been able to get it right yet, but we will get there because I think we were really close last year. We just had a few uh, dangling issues that we could uh, probably have done without and passed at least something. But that's something, you know, we need to keep people in their homes for the, especially now. Thank you. Charlotte Mena, please. Thanks. Um, so I think about this in two tracks. Uh, one is confronting the current homelessness crisis and the other is prevention to make sure that this doesn't continue to grow and affect more people. Um, so in terms of confronting the crisis that is in front of us, you know, I'm a big supporter of housing first policies, um, you know, uh, permanent supportive housing and ensuring that our shelters are low barrier and that are prepared to receive um, you know, different kinds of, you know, LGBTQ youth are disproportionately impacted by homelessness as well as um, youth of color. So making sure that they're prepared to serve everyone. Um, as far as prevention, um, this is uh, this is something that I think is really important in the 29th especially. Um, so I think inclusionary zoning, making sure that we have enough housing, making sure that we have different kinds of dwelling units, um, as well as the tenant protections and rights um, going forward. And the wraparound services that sort of support families before it becomes too late. Thank you. Um, Follow-up question, and we'll start with Charlotte, two minutes, and then Steve Kirby, uh, one minute. Do you think housing first is a successful approach to addressing homelessness? And if so, what actions would you propose to implement this approach, including funding and timelines? If not, what alternatives would you propose? Charlotte. Yes, absolutely. Housing first is the way to do this. I mean, essentially what we're saying here is you should be able to get a roof over your head without any stipulations um, and without going through all these hoops, right? Like people that are required to say, you know, kick a drug habit before they are able to get a roof over them. That doesn't make any sense. You know, battling with addiction is an illness and it needs to be treated as such. We wouldn't ask somebody else who's sick to get better before we give them a roof over their heads. Um, so I think we need to consider um, how we implement this at the state. Um, I think we need to do it as quickly as possible. I'm worried about what happens when the eviction moratorium runs out. I'm worried about how much people back owe. I'm worried about kids. We've got 4,000 students, um, you know, that are in all four school districts um, that are experiencing homelessness right now. This is absolutely critical that people are housed first and foremost as quickly as possible. Steve? Yeah, okay, well, there was nothing there to disagree with, so I'm not going to. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I really just couldn't agree more. But I, there's just really not much else to say. Okay. We'll move on to the next question then. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will never object to people it's saying- a great thing to agree on, right? Yeah. Yeah. That we're yeah. all rowing in the same direction. Yeah, well, and how can you not? Yeah, okay, well, that's a, another. Okay, so the <laughs> next question, we're, we're changing gears here, um, and we'll start with Steve, again, two minutes, and then Charlotte, one. What legislation, if any, would you support to address climate change and its impacts? Well, we could pass the bill that I introduced uh, last time out. Um, might be a little more interesting this time because we have certain uh, um, uh, experiences now that uh, we didn't have then. I proposed a, uh, a bill to declare a climate emergency um, and give the governor emergency powers. Um, and um, now they'd be a little different than what we're doing right now through COVID because um, the governor would then, you know, propose um, various things having to do with uh, climate change. And I think we've got the right person in place to do that right now. So that was kind of what I was thinking. Um, 
Now, the difference is that the, um, there would be uh, the ability for the, um, for the legislature to overturn anything that they didn't like. But I did that on purpose because it's, it's, it's way um, easier to, um, well, it's, it's harder to overturn something because you'd have to actually pass a bill to do that rather than to pass a bill um, that um, that the, that would just be required if you were going to support what the governor wanted to do that that could die a lot more easily so just, it kind of tilts it a little bit so that we can get things done and the whole idea is to streamline these things because we're not getting it done and we've got to do that that's something that my generation um, you know just really you know, we just, we just, we did our best with what we had to work with, but uh, we're out of time. It's time to do something and we need to do it as fast as we can. And giving the governor emergency powers to do that is, is the fastest and quickest way. Thank you. Charlotte Mena. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, according to the United Nations um, IPCC, we have just 10 years to act to avoid absolute climate catastrophe. And by the way, climate change, as we know, is already being felt first and hardest by indigenous peoples and communities of color. So we absolutely have to address this. It's imperative. Um, I support the Evergreen Future Plan, um, which includes climate action, toxics reductions, as well as habitat restoration. It's important that we honor tribal treaty rights and that we honor all of our communities as we make this transition. One of the biggest policies that we need to implement and get past is the clean fuel standard. We have to reduce emissions from the transportation sector because it is the largest emitting sector. Um, then we need to ensure that the state has the authority it needs to meet our aggressive reduction targets. And finally, we need to figure out how to do carbon capture for the remaining and residual pollution that exists in the air. Thank you. Um, the next question also has to do with environmental issues. What environmental protections need consideration and legislation? Are there protections you believe should be repealed and why? We'll start with Charlotte and then Steve. Um, yeah, there are no protections that need to be repealed. I work at the Department of Ecology. I've worked for Governor Inslee on climate and environmental protection policy. I think right now we've seen a lot of egregious actions from this federal administration, rolling back you know, critical policies that protect us from pollution and climate change. But they've also abdicated their role to protect the environment and use the COVID uh, crisis as an excuse to say, we don't need our industries to monitor and we don't need them to be held accountable. They can just cite COVID as a problem. As I've said over and over again, air pollution, water pollution affect low income communities more often than any other community. There is PFAS contamination in Lakewood around the base. There is air pollution in our area. We absolutely have to consider all of the environmental justice pieces as we make decisions going forward, whether it's permitting a project and considering what it looks like now. You know, I want to support policies where in which we use the fees that we get from companies that, you know, don't meet their obligations to fund clean projects. We did this at the Department of Ecology with the Volkswagen settlement money, and we used it to provide electric school buses uh, in various neighborhoods, including in South Tacoma. That's what we need to be looking to do. Steve Kirby. Yeah, so repealing uh, environmental protections is going the wrong way. Um, we have, uh, we've actually did, we've, we've made some real progress uh, um, just in the last cycle. Uh, once, uh, once the obstacle uh, over in the Senate was uh, cleared out, we were able to pass some very significant legislation. I'm proud to say that my, my campaign is endorsed by the you know, Washington Conservation Voters and the Sierra Club. Um, I value my environmental uh, record and um, I will work with the people uh, who are, are working on those issues right now, not, right, pro not probably right this minute, not like the budget guys, they are working, but the environmental people have a regular ongoing uh, process that they're going through to ensure that we can finish um, what we started. Thank you. Um, there is an audience question, um, so I will ask that here. Um, we'll start with Steve, and and then um, and then we'll move on. Then, uh, there are calls to divert some police funding for social services. Would you support this? 
what kinds of services would be offered um, to those with mental health issues? So Steve, do you want to start with that one and then we'll go to Charlotte? Yeah, I'd almost have to put my old city council hat back on because uh, these are things that will be done um, at the at the local level. Um, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent. I I just don't have a good enough handle on what the the. I'll take Tacoma as an example. Um, I don't know what their budget situation is, how much of their money goes towards police and that sort of thing, and I don't know what the impacts would be in terms of response time. We still need to have you know a, a police presence. Um, I'm I don't know that that diverting money is is necessarily the answer. I think redoing what it means to be a police officer is what needs to be done. Um, you know, I would I would put money into that because it'll take money, and we may have to um, basically train a whole different uh, class of people to be answering certain calls for service, because uh, what we're doing right now is just dangerous, and 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 it's it's just disastrous. It's happening right here in our district, and. And I'm, um, I'm whatever it takes. Um, I would, I would, I would say that we need to, we need to address this, and we need to do it fast. We we can't, we can't just let this thing go and then wait till the next incident. We can't do that. Thank you, Charlotte. I really appreciate this question. Um, you know, I think that solutions must center black voices since black people are at the center of this crisis. And what I've heard from members of our community is that they're sick and tired of incrementalism and that this problem isn't going away. So to that end, I think every single option should be on the table. Um, and I understand that, you know, funding comes for different law enforcement agencies at different levels, but I think that it is absolutely imperative that leadership comes from every single level and that our elected leaders are supporting the communities that have you know, been hurt by this violence. And so absolutely, I think we should look at, hey, what is this money being spent on? Is it being sent, spent on buying surplus military equipment? We don't need it. Let's absolutely put that back into education and health services. Um, as far as mental health, I think you know, we need to be funding professionals that are trained in helping folks that are struggling with mental health issues. And that's where I think that funding would be best used. Thank you. Um, our next question, uh, we'll start with Charlotte and then Steve. Um, with the passage of Initiative 976 affecting uh, transportation budgets, what do you see as the priorities for Washington State transportation infrastructure and how would you fund them? Charlotte. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we're seeing a huge hole and at the same time, other funding that we get for transportation is down in terms of gas tax, tolling tax, everyone's been under stay home order and, you know, being safely distanced. So we're, we're seeing an opportunity to rethink how do we fund the transportation budget. Um, you know, I do support a clean uh, a carbon fee, um, you know, one that doesn't, you know, protects folks from incurring that cost down the line, whether it's through assistance or otherwise. Um, but I think a couple things are, you know, green infrastructure, green charging stations, and most importantly, public transit. Public transit, we don't have reliable public transit in every part of the district. Um, it's hard to catch a bus in Spanaway. I've, I've heard folks tell me that they're walking a mile to the nearest bus station. Um, we need people to have a reliable way to get to the doctor, to work, to school. Um, and that absolutely has to be our priority, getting more cars off the road and making sure that folks have access to transit. Thank you. Steve? So in terms of infrastructure um, and funding, uh, um, we were we were dealt quite a blow by um, the passage of, of that initiative, and um, and truly everything needs to be on the table. We we're, we're really we're going to have to come up with another uh, uh, some some kind of other funding source. The gas tax isn't going to cut it, you know, long term. Um, you know, people are going to use less and less gas, which, is, by the way, is a good thing. That's what we're trying to encourage people to do. But, um, you know, everything has to be on the table. Um, I think mostly what we need to do is, is try not to go backwards. That's the most important thing is to try to hold on to 
the, you know, the policies that we have in place right now, because otherwise I'm concerned that the, the transit options that we're talking about are the first thing to go, and that should not be the case. Thank you. Um, the next question um, has to do with healthcare on everyone's mind. Um, what is your position on single payer healthcare for all Washingtonians? If you do not support it or until we have it, how will you work to ensure adequate health care for all Washingtonians? We'll start with two minutes for Steve Kirby and then one minute for Charlotte Menno. Steve? Yeah, so, you know, we're kind of fortunate in our state in that we've uh, been aware of, you know, a, a way, there are ways to, to ensure that, that people have adequate uh, health care. Um, it, you know, certainly it costs money. And I'm here to tell you that that's going to be an issue in the next uh, cycle. But nevertheless, um, I personally am a supporter of the single payer uh, bill. Um, I think uh, the consensus among, um, you know, I think, well, the majority so far in the legislature has been that we have to kind of go through uh, a transition time and that there will probably always be, you know, a private option until such time as they just can't uh, compete with, a, with, with a, a public option. But we need to get there and we need to get there sooner rather than later um, because it, it, again, it's, 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 it's a disgrace that we in this country um, don't have a single payer system. Charlotte Mena? 100% support a single payer system. I think in the meantime, as you say, we're gonna to have to figure out solutions. Um, we do have a public option that is starting in January, but we need to continue to fund critical places like community health centers where anyone can walk in, whether they have insurance or not, or whether they're an American citizen or not. So making sure that those kinds of things remain the focus as we're working on recovery. Um, the other thing is, you know, we've passed anti-discrimination legislation for folks that need gender affirming services, but we still have to close the gap for folks that, you know, live here, work here, and pay taxes, but may not be documented. We need to ensure that everyone has access to health care. Um, the last thing I want to share is, you know, we're talking comprehensive health care that includes, you know, sexual and reproductive rights as well as abortion. Um, you know, I've been really proud to be endorsed by Planned Parenthood and NARAL as well as Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who's pushing for a single payer system at the national level. Thank you. Um, the next question will start with Charlotte Mena and then go to uh, Steve Kirby. 44% of the COVID-19 cases in Washington state are among Hispanics, who make up only 13% of the population. Many of these cases are among essential agricultural, construction, and healthcare workers, some of whom are not documented and therefore do not have health insurance. How would you address this gap in coverage? Yeah, you know, this one absolutely hits very close to home. You know, like I said, my parents were immigrant farm workers. Um, you know, they worked in the fields, they worked at the IVP meat cutting factory. Um, and I, you know, still have relatives who do this work and who don't have an option of not going to work. One, because it's essential and two, because they absolutely need that paycheck. Um, one thing that is not being done is, you know, folks are not being provided with um, the proper protective equipment that they need. Um, and that absolutely has to be first and foremost. I think as a state and as leader, we need to hold employers accountable and say, you know, if you're not able to provide that, folks can't work. I mean, absolutely. There's, there's no way around that. We can't have people endangering themselves and their families by not giving them the equipment that they need. Um, the other thing is there's all these there's all this red tape, um, you know, and hoops to jump through for people to be able to get health care. You have to be a permanent resident for five years and so on and so forth. I want to make sure that we eliminate those barriers because people that live here are part of our communities, pay into our tax system, deserve that health care. And that's something that I'm very passionate about and will be a very vocal advocate for. Thank you. Steve Kirby? Yeah, I think a lot of this problem is caused by the attitude of our federal leadership um, uh, because um, it, it is, it's easy to really abuse these workers these days because they're afraid to complain. And, you know, we just, we can't have that. I think that's happening. I think, I think that, uh, um, that people are, are being exposed 
um, unnecessarily and um, unfairly and, and unjustly and, and, uh, and we're seeing the, the results of it. And it's because of the, the well, hopefully this is, a, this is a situation that'll take care of itself after the general election. Um, and, you know, and very soon after that. But in the meantime, Charlotte is ex exactly right. That's, that's what we have to do to try to fill that gap. Okay, sorry. Thank you. The next question, um, we'll start with Steve. You'll have two minutes and then Charlotte, one minute. What should the legislature do to ensure the state has the necessary supplies, equipment, and services to address this pandemic and future emergencies? such as another pandemic, an earthquake, a volcanic eruption, or a tsunami, all of which are highly possible in Pierce County. So tell me, what, what was the actual question? What, what, what should the legislature do to ensure the state has the necessary supplies, equipment, and services to address this pandemic and future emergencies? Sure. Okay, the question answers itself. Um, we, <laughs> We we need to uh, we need to be better prepared. Um, I I have to say you know I've been I've been I've been an elected official for you know a total of thirty five years over a over a, almost a forty five year period. Um, nobody saw this coming, and you know and I have to tell you nobody knew how ill prepared we were. That's what I think um, caught us off guard. I don't think that'll happen again. And uh, just in case, we need to prepare. Um, we need to actually, you know, think about preparing for the next one now. This is a perfect time for us to um, know exactly, you know, what what went wrong, what could have, what what would have been better, and we can make those things better. We can fix that, and we need to fix that because all we have to do it's it's front loaded in terms of its cost, and so just let's. Let's do it. Let's be prepared. Let's have plans in place. That's, you know, that's something that that just wasn't there. Uh, it's amazing, really. I'm, I'm, I am, again, I'm, I'm really proud of our governor for, you know, the manner in which he has used uh, science and listened to his, uh, his health department people and, and, you know, has really done the best he could with what he's had to work with. But uh, we're in a good position now. We need to do it while it's still fresh in our minds. Thank you. Charlotte Mena. Yeah, I mean, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We may not have known that we were gonna explicitly be hit with COVID-19, but we knew that a lot of folks were suffering before then, and this has only made that worse. So it's a good thing that we had a rainy day fund. I think we have to work toward plussing that up once we're at the other side of this and we have the room to do so again. I think we need to plus up relief funds, make sure that we have unemployment funds. Again, once we're able to do that to make sure that we're prepared, but I think being proactive and making sure that folks you know, are, are well, that we're raising the minimum wage, that they have health care, that they are prepared to weather the next storm because emergencies are really a matter of you know, when, not if. Um, the last thing, you know, besides beefing up social services and having those things ready is do the proactive work of fighting climate change because we absolutely know that tsunamis, things are going to hit the coast and we need to be doing everything we can to avoid catastrophe. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, how do you propose to work in a bipartisan way to address social conflicts and community health threats? And we'll start with Charlotte, two minutes, and then Steve, one minute. Yeah, so, you know, I've worked in government for the last 10 years. I worked in the US Congress. I've worked for Governor Inslee as his Deputy Director of Federal Affairs, and I've even worked in the Washington State Senate. Um, the way that we get bills done is on a bipartisan basis. You know, I was really proud to work on salmon recovery legislation that I stewarded through the US Congress that ultimately received votes from all 12 members of the delegation, Republicans and Democrats, and that's sometimes what it takes. So there are many values that we agree on, you know, the health of our residents, um, salmon recovery, you know, making sure that working people have a fair opportunity, that our kids have a good education. Uh, we need to build those coalitions, find room where we can, and make sure that we're not compromising our values um, in, in that uh, compromise, if you will. We're making sure that those who are 
most often ignored are not the ones that are left out from the conversation. Um, there was an analysis done of bills that come through the legislature, a vast majority, over 90% are bipartisan. I don't think Olympia is as gridlocked as people think it is. And I think we have to continue that tradition of working together in the service of our districts and people. Thank you, Steve Kirby. So on our worst day, we don't even remotely resemble those folks in the other Washington. Um, as Charlotte said, um, I, I didn't use a study. I was just anecdotally, it looks to me as though about 90% of the bills that we pass are either unanimous or nearly unanimous. Almost everybody can agree on most of what we do. And so, you know, in terms of uh, working across the aisle, it's really stunning how some, you know, so many people go to Olympia and they, they think it's their job to fight with the other side. And that's just not what we're there for. We're there to get the job done. When I walk into that Republican caucus, I get a standing ovation and they mean it because I've been working with people across the aisle for 20 years. They trust me, even though we don't agree on a, on a lot of things, that's what it takes to get things done. Thank you. The next question. What does the legislature, what role does the legislature have in creating living wage jobs in Washington state? And we'll start with Steve, two minutes, and then Charlotte, one minute. Yeah, this is always, I never know how to answer this question. We get it, you know, all the time. You'd think I'd know by now, but it's a moving target for one thing. Um, you know, because the economy, when the economy is, uh, is booming along, um, you know, family wage jobs happen. Um, you know, we were, we, we were doing pretty well uh, until it hit the fan, you know, and so, so here we are. Um, but we need to, we need to just uh, really look at, at new ways of, uh, of providing, um, you know, green jobs, for example. Um, we need to have, uh, we need to have jobs that, you know, that don't just pay minimum wage. We need to, you know, there are, there are entirely new industries that we could attract here that are, that are good uh, family wage jobs. And so, you know, we need to enable those things. We also need to do things like, um, like to make sure that our minimum wage is in fact at least a livable wage and kind of use that as a base to work off of. So, you know, we should be able to, you should be able to raise your family. If you're, if you've got a job, it should pay enough for you to um, be able to, to uh, at least, you know, feed your family and do the, the very basic needs that you have to, to address in, at, at home. And, but, you know, that's the kind of thing that we can do is to just enable businesses to be successful but without, you know, and, but maintaining, um, you know, consumer protections. That's the, that's the balance. That's what I do. I chair the Consumer Protection and Business Committee. And the idea is to regulate those businesses in a way that doesn't hurt anyone, but does, you know, it's not the anti-business um, committee. It's the, you know, Consumer Protection and Business Committee. Those are the kinds of things that we can do to try to make it so that employers can have, can afford to pay a living wage. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. I think the way that we choose to do our budget and invest now is going to have an effect on those industries. And so I want us to make sure that we're putting money into industries where we want to stimulate that growth. So for example, you know, environmental restoration projects, watershed restoration projects create thousands of jobs and most of the money spent in that area comes back to the local city um, you know, or district. So that's another place where we need to be working with the federal government and making sure that we as a state have the policies in place to be able to move forward on those projects are ready and competitive for those grants. Another thing we can do is invest in childcare. Um, most people that own their own childcare business are women um, and usually women of color. I think as we you know, build up those subsidies for families that need them, we're also stimulating that part of the economy. Um, and finally, continuing um, to invest in career and technical training, as well as opportunities for our kids to go to school um, and learn those areas that they wanna then take the jobs in, including you know, tech industry and things that are really growing in, in the west side of Washington. Thank you. 
Um, the next question is a two-part question. Um, are there services provided by the government agencies that you believe would be more appropriately provided by private agencies? And are there services currently provided by private agencies that you believe could be provided more efficiently by government agencies? So we'll start with Charlotte Mena and then Steve Kirby. Two minutes and then one minute. Um, I don't think so. I, I don't, I can't think of anything um, that is currently better served by a private entity um, than the government itself. And I think this falls in line with, you know, my belief that you know, government is here to serve the people um, and is not here to make a profit, which is why I believe we should move toward a single payer system and ensure that everyone has health care and that people aren't just being, you know, strung out for the most money possible. Um, you know, there's an issue that I think about a lot. Um, and I was asked this question, you know, should, should our prisons be private or should they be, you know, government owned? And I fundamentally believe that we should be working toward a system where people are getting the help they need in restoration. Um, but I certainly do feel like there's an issue with private prisons and the private detention center in our area. So that's something I want to explore with the community and advocates a bit more. But otherwise, I think, you know, government services are um, rightly where they need to be to best serve the people. Thank you. Steve Kirby? So, yeah. Um in a minute, you know, um, uh, the, the answer is generally I don't support um, privatizing government services because as Charlotte points out, the one thing that we don't uh, uh, have to include in our, um, in our formulas are, is a profit margin. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's no way, unless you want to, you know, provide substandard, you know, wages and benefits, there's no way that they can do it in any any for any less money than than the government can. And in fact, I think there are certain things that have been privatized over the years that we need to um, kind of rein back in and uh, put them, you know, in put the government in charge of those government services because there's it's, they don't lend themselves to the private sector. Thank you. So we come to the last question, um, and we'll start with Steve and then, um, and then Charlotte. Um, and this one has to do with salmon, um, last but not least. Salmon recovery and enhanced projects call for removal of the Snake River dams and oppose the Chehalis River uh, flood retention facility. What is your position on these and why? Steve. You, you know, I've been sitting here kind of saying to myself, you know, gosh, Charlotte always gets the harder questions, you know, what she has to go first on, and I felt kind of bad about that. But uh, this is one that this is not my area in in the legislature, and in fact, uh, frankly, I, my, I'm probably going to just uh, the best way for me to answer this would be to say I agree with whatever Charlotte's going to say. So, um, but I mean, generally speaking, I just have not done the the research that it takes. Um, to know what the impacts of, of those things will be. And I'm, I, just, I just don't know. If I, if I knew that I had to make that choice myself uh, anytime uh, soon, I would, um, you know, I've got until, you know, the end of the next session to figure that out. I do share office space with the person um, who chairs the committee that does uh, uh, those bills. And so, uh, I have real good access to the information, but frankly, it's just not, uh, it, of all the things that happen in the legislature, um, I, I do, you know, the things in the committees that I serve on and then other things that are kind of, uh, um, you know, at the, the obvious ones, you know, housing and education and that sort of thing. This is just one, I couldn't tell you. So I'm gonna, I will tell you right now, I'm gonna, I, I'm going to agree with Charlotte. Okay. Well, I that That's because my this, answer. <laughs> this is my area of expertise. Um, and this is. Is I worked on a lot uh, in the governor's office and at the Department of Ecology, and it is um, an issue that has largely far, fallen on you know partisan lines, and it is rooted in a really um, you know a very real desire to recover salmon, which we spend millions and millions of dollars on every year. Um, and it makes sense that we want to do everything possible to recover that salmon and meet our tribal treaty obligations. 
Um, you know, right now there's a compromise in place that the Department of Ecology um, is leading, which is something called duck spill, which means that we allow more spill in times of low energy usage for salmon to pass through, um, and we do less spill um, in times of high energy usage. I think this is a good compromise to support because it was supported by all parties, including the Bonneville Power Administration, including the environmental groups, and including the ratepayers. Um, I understand being from Eastern Washington, you know, how folks feel like they're often stampeded on by environmental interests in Western Washington. I think that this is a great thing to support. Um, and as far as Chehalis, I just want to briefly say, you know, we are working on projects to make sure that we have enough water well into the future for salmon and for people. And so water retention structures, I think, are critically important. Thank you. Now it's time for closing statements. Each candidate gets up to one minute um, to make a closing statement. We'll change the order of the op um, that we did in opening statements. So we'll begin with Charlotte Mena and then Steve Kirby. So one minute, please. Charlotte. Thank you. Well, I mostly just want to thank you for your time and the opportunity to be here um, and have a really productive discussion on these issues. Um, you know, as I started saying at the beginning uh, in my opening statement, you know, I think it's really important who we sent to the legislature. Um, you know, we had a really big showdown in the state Senate a couple years ago when a, a crop of new members were elected, you know, who basically said, you know, we're not going to vote for the budget unless you put I-1000 on the floor. Um, and, you know, doing that, they were able to pass, um, you know, repeal the ban on affirmative action. And so who is in the room, um, what their experiences are, and what they bring to the table and what they're willing to fight for is really important. Um, I bring a lot of different experiences, and I understand that my experience is not universal, you know, but my work has been to bring in other voices of those that are often from marginalized communities. So thank you for your time again. Um, appreciate being here. Thank you. Steve Kirby. Yeah, and again, and I, I agree, thank you very much. You know, really what's going to happen um, is that this it's gonna be all COVID-19 all the time. So the priority is going to be repairing the, the damage done to our economy by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's going to take someone with the, the political experience and agility necessary to, to navigate what I believe to be will, are going to be the most uh, treacherous political waters in state history. I guess my my bottom line is this is not a good time to replace someone like me um, in the House of Representatives. Thank you all. Um, Terry Harder, Steve Kirby, and Charlotte Mena are the candidates for the Legislative District 29 House Position 2. Terry Harder couldn't be with us. But um, we did have two wonderful candidates here today. And um, please vote for your choice in the primary election by August 4th. You should have your ballot by July 20th. Um, I'd also like to thank our timekeeper, Cynthia Stewart. She's down there. I don't know where she's on your screen, but thank you very much, Cynthia. And I also want to thank our co-sponsors. Um, obviously, the Tacoma Pierce County League of Women Voters and our co-sponsors, American Association of University Women, Centro Latino, Eastside Neighborhood um, Advisory Council of Tacoma, the NAACP, St. Leo Church, um, Summit Waller Community Association, Tacoma Pierce Affordable Housing Consortium, Tacoma South End Neighborhood Council, Tacoma Urban League, UW Tacoma School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, and the YWCA of Pierce County. We thank them all. Please watch for other League of Women Voter candidate forums. They're listed at our website, www.tacomapierceleagueofwomenvoters.org slash 2020elections.html. Read your voters pamphlet and look at vote411.org. That's vote411.org, where you can find answers to questions posed to all candidates running for office. Read all the candidates' websites to find out what they represent and do all you can to be an educated voter. And don't forget to vote on August 4th. Thank you everyone for participating. Big round to the candidates. Thank you.